Hello, everyone. Welcome to our session today on stakeholder capitalism, building the future. We have a fantastic panel with us. We're going to start this session with the expert on stakeholder capitalism, the WEF chairman and founder, Klaus Schwab. Um, Klaus has a new book out today on this subject that will launch our panel and then we'll um, we'll join in a in a broader discussion. Um, Klaus, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Edward. Uh, it's really a very important uh, moment, not just because I'm publishing a book, uh, but we are witnessing a mindset change. I think we are moving from the priority of uh, short-term shareholder profit maximization to a world which is characterized much more by stakeholder responsibility. The COVID crisis has shown us that companies which uh, were committed uh, to the stakeholder concept have performed much better because they have invested into the long-term vitality of the company. So um, what we have to do now and what is very uh, important is to walk the talk. And walking the talk means not just to talk about stakeholder capitalism, but also to establish a framework of metrics uh, which allow everybody to see that a company is performing according to the ESG criteria. So the International Business Council of the World Economic Forum has undertaken uh, the task, uh, together with the four big audit companies, to develop such a comprehensive system which allows not only a a reporting process where um, the companies can be really measured, but which allows also to see progress companies are making, similar to the financial reporting system. I, I feel um, this um, uh, mindset change uh, is essential if we want to move from a world which is just based on material objectives uh, like GDP and so on to a world which is much more conscious of the well-being of people. And I think the COVID crisis has shown us that uh, we have to pay more attention to the well-being. And this means, and I come back, a change in the approach of business philosophy to move really to a large-scale stakeholder capitalism so so this is this is a book uh you you were writing you had started writing before the pandemic it's really a book you've been writing for 50 years but you were working on this book then as you write in the book february of 2020 comes and you had what you call an acbc moment realizing that everything was about to change there was an after covid world and a before covid world that were going to be not nothing alike can you talk about how the pandemic not just shifted your thinking on stakeholder capitalism, but the, the landscape that it operates in? I think uh, the, the notion of stakeholder capitalism is an old one. I wrote about it 50 years ago, and we should not forget that last year, major change happened when the US Business Roundtable, which represents major uh, companies in the United States actually issued a statement embracing the stakeholder concept. Now, what has happened with the um, uh, crisis, with the corona crisis, is showing us that um, people expect more from governments and business, not just material uh, satisfaction, but security, for example, uh, in terms of health services. Uh, but what we also have learned is that all those services um, related to uh, cleaning up the environment, uh, providing uh, the necessary diversity inside companies and society, 
This cannot only take undertaken by governments or by business alone or by civil society alone. We really need public-private uh, cooperation. So the, yes, crisis yes. Has shown, the crisis has shown us we need a mindset change and we need also to move um, from a, a society where business and, gov and governments have very separate tasks to a society where the two uh, together with uh, civil society work hand in hand. How different do you think the book is, the final form of the book, versus where it would have was headed prior to that moment, that realization in, in February? I think uh, the, the big change is the people are much more open today uh, compared to a year ago where we felt all uh, being in a society which is well-doing and so on. Now they have noticed the fragility of um, a global society. So we went from crisis to extreme crisis in a way. Health crisis, economic crisis, inequality crisis, trust crisis, democracy yes. crisis. Um, and that has, um, that has spurred this openness. So, so everybody um, went into panic mode. We all did um, uh, around this time last year. Um, obviously, some companies fared extremely well in the pandemic, um, but of course, far more, particularly small businesses, have suffered terribly. How has that impacted, not, not the philosophy of stakeholder capitalism, but the ability of companies across the spectrum to execute it? You ask me? Yeah. Yeah, or, yes. Or we'll a question to you and then we'll open to the, to the group. The, the, no, I, what, what we are seeing, frankly, is the companies now really engage. And um, I see it in terms uh, um, of our different initiatives. The forum has about 100 initiatives uh, related to um, uh, climate issues, related to uh, creating jobs and so on. Uh, what we are seeing is that at least multinational big companies engage much more compared uh, to a year ago. I think they have uh, listened to the people who have great expectations today, expectations which means that they have to exercise stakeholder responsibility. I guess I was, I was really asking about the smaller companies that have suffered much more and, and for whom, um, you know, survival minute by minute is, is such a focus right now. How, how, how are you seeing it? Is it playing out at all beyond big companies? I mean, for this to, to really uh, grow, obviously it's got to go beyond the largest companies and include the way everybody thinks about capitalism and their employees and their community. No, it's my big concern because um, uh, small and medium-sized companies have been much more hit by the crisis compared to uh, large companies or most large companies. So um, I'm, I'm very pleased and I think it's a task of society to take care because they are an essential part of the, our economic tissue. So we have to make sure that it's not uh, their fault that they can survive uh, the crisis because we need, at the end of the crisis, we need still a prospering middle class in the, as, as far as companies are concerned. Thank you. Let's, let's now open it up to our um, terrific, terrific panel. We have um, to introduce them, and I don't think I introduced myself at the beginning. I'm Edward Felsenthal. I'm the Editor-in-Chief and CEO of Time. And I'm joined today by Professor Klaus, whom you just heard from, also by Mariana Mazzucato, a professor at University College London, where there's snow on the ground, I gather. Uh, she's also the author of a new book um, uh, coming out uh, this week, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> called Mission, e Mission Economy, A Moonshot Guide to Changing Capitalism. We have uh, with us Dan Schulman, the president and CEO of PayPal, where he's been since 2014. We have four-time Grammy Award winner, the amazing 
Anjali Kijo, musician, UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador. Great to have you here with us from Paris. Yes. And we have Ale Alexander de Croo, the Prime Minister of Belgium. Prime Minister de Croo, welcome Hello. to you as well. I want to start with you um, in part because I know you have to, just to let the audience know, you've got, uh, uh, can't imagine um, what's on your to-do list every day, but I know you have to leave a few minutes. Um, let's, let's, you, you took over as prime minister um, in October, um, a country with um, one of the highest death tolls per capita death rates um, in the world, certainly in Europe. Um, facing a massive economic uh, recession, the worst in probably 100 years. Um, I guess I'll say in that context, how are you? Um, and, and give us a sense, you know, it's, it's been a few months. Um, where do you assess the recovery, both the health recovery and the economic uh, recovery, given what you, uh, what you faced coming into office? Well, first of all, thank you for the, uh, the, the invitation and, and, and a discussion, which I think is a very, very timely one. Um, one thing I would like to, to, to start off with is that over the last years, all of us um, in the, uh, in public, uh, on the public side and the private side, we've been talking so much about uh, trust. Um, and this is a moment to not talk about trust, but to show that we can be trustworthy. And it's an incredibly difficult time to do so because we're confronted to something which is new to, uh, to most of us, which is new to the public. I think the, the Western European public is confronted to, to a level of vulnerability that we thought was, uh, was not there. I mean, we, we would live a safe life and never be confronted to anything, uh, anything like that. Um, and so in these very unstable times, showing that we can create trust with all the things that happen which which you could not um, know in advance and seeing actually week by week that we are confronted to something uh, to something new is i would say in politics it's a new sport in politics uh, i'd have to say i feel much more as a coach of the population than i have ever been this is about keeping people motivated this is about explaining the things we know, but also explaining the things we don't know. It's very often also telling that we have made a decision and we thought it was the right decision because of these reasons, but it is clear now that actually it maybe was not the right, uh, the right decision. And really trying to explain to everyone, we are a population of 11 million, um, that we are a team of 11 million. And that as a team, we can beat this. We actually did a communication campaign around that uh, as well. And, and really convincing every person that everyone in their own individual action has an impact on this crisis, has an impact on its own health, and especially an impact on the health of everyone. And, and, and maybe to conclude with that, I think that element that people now are convinced of in, in, the, in the medical, in the health uh, sphere, if we could keep that and keep that mindset in the recovery, being also in economic recovery, my own actions have an impact on myself, but have an impact on, on the society. I think that would be a great thing. If, if we could take that out of this crisis, I think it will be one of the determining elements to, to, to economically get out of this crisis. Let's, let's talk about trust for a moment. Um, uh, It'll be a running theme throughout the discussion. You've talked about um, just now the um, the team work part of trust, the the collaboration uh, that's required um, to establish trust, the deliverables that are required to establish trust. What about something I think about in my role all the time, and I'm sure you do, and all of us do, um, uh, the connection between truth and trust, and this crisis we're facing, I didn't even mention as I ticked them off earlier, uh, around misinformation. Mm -hmm. How do you um, think about and combating, um, uh, combating misinformation as you try to build this, this team? We are confronted with that uh, every day. Now, we, have, we are in an atmosphere where 
Um, there are experts. Um, they, they're basically growing out of the grounds, experts in everything, especially a lot of, uh, obviously, virologists and, and vaccinologists and so on. They have a very uh, broad audience in the, in, in the Belgian press. I, I would say that there's even, there's almost more space for, for experts in the, in, the medical, uh, in the medical domain than there is place for, for politicians, and maybe that's not wrong. I think we find a way where um, the expert voices and the political voices um, work together. Often we get sometimes a bit on each other's domain and, and that does create some tension uh, from time to time. Um, but very often, and I've often said it, look, if you, if you want to be convinced that being vaccinated is a good thing, I'm not going to convince you. Listen to a vaccinologist, listen to an expert. I am going to get vaccinated, I'm convinced. But if you have doubts, then listen to the experts and, and, and science should be able to, uh, uh, to convince you. I think that this is a great moment to make a link between uh, experts, scientists, give them, give them an audience and politicians, policymakers and, uh, and so on. Now, does this mean that there are no wild conspiracy theories going around? No, obviously not. But if you look at the, the share of people who are willing to get vaccinated is actually quite high in Belgium. It's somewhere between 75 and 80 percent, which is which is incredibly, uh, incredibly high. Um, the trust discussion is now also more and more towards the cooperation between governments and the vaccine producing companies. Uh, there are very high hopes. Um, a lot of people, the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel they see is the vaccine. The fact that there are now delays um, in the production and, and, and is something extremely hard for the popula population to, uh, to cope with. Because it seems that that light at the end of the tunnel, it's, it's basically going through their hands. That's a hard one. And I think more transparency from, from the corporate side on what is going on and explaining that producing a vaccine is a bit more complicated than baking bread is, is, is a message that, that should get uh, across more often. Yeah. And the, the science around the variants, which we're still um, struggling to understand. I, I have uh, so many questions um, uh, across the panel, but I, I before we move on, I, I, I would love to, and I'm sure the audience would love to, to just get your, um, uh, you just gave a sense of it, the, the blurry light um, at the end of the tunnel, but, but where 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 are you two and a half months in? Um, how do you how do you see uh, where Belgium is right now? Are you um, mm -hmm. at a moment of optimism, pessimism, somewhere somewhere in the middle with all the challenges? Mm -hmm. Well, we we've had a, a, an extremely difficult second wave. Uh, we have been able in, in in eight weeks eight weeks time to move from the worst country in Europe to today one of the best countries. There there's not that many countries that are in a better situation than us but still a very worrying uh, situation. Um, and we will do everything to keep that rather advantageous situation that we, that we have. My view is that vaccination will, of course, come up to speed and, and the months of February and March are going to be very difficult because the, the active population at large is not yet in the scope of vaccination. But once that starts, and that will be uh, March, uh, March, April, I would think that rapidly we will start open again uh, public life and restaurants and bars and, and, and so on. And that will have a huge impact on the way we look at the future. Um, today, it's hard. I mean, end of January, February, these are the dark months in general. Um, and yeah, people are extremely fed up with this. So I would hope that the coming weeks are the hardest ones and that when the sun is coming, that uh, the light of the vaccines will be, uh, will be shining into people's minds as well. Thank you. Um, I hope so. Um, Mariano, Mariano Mazzucato, um, uh, you've, you've been everywhere um, during this pandemic and advising the Pope working with the World Health Organization, also writing for Time Magazine, mm -hmm. um, uh, and I want to talk about your book. But but I, but you wrote um, 
a really provocative uh, piece for us uh, here um, in our um, our issue, the Great Reset, um, which we did in partnership with the forum, in which you um, went through a really fascinating um, thought exercise, imagining um, we're in 2023, uh, end of 2023, the same people, um, a different uh, society, that, that we we succeeded, that the that the light was there at the end of the tunnel, that we made that we made progress on all these issues where we need a reset, where the crisis is um, prompting reset. What does that look like um, in three years if if we get it right? And and uh, how 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 did we do it um, from that perspective? Great, and thanks for both asking me to write that piece and to join this uh, panel again. So really at the center of both my new book on um, a mission economy, but also that piece is the idea that, you know, Klaus's wonderful concept of stakeholder capitalism can't just be about corporate governance and how the corporate world interacts with, you know, different stakeholders. It actually has to go to the center of how we design our capitalist system because there's different ways to do that. And we unfortunately have really a wrong design, uh, both in terms again of the whole issue of shareholder maximization versus this kind of more purpose-driven stakeholder uh, value concept, but really you know, the nitty gritty of how business uh, interacts with government and with the broader kind of you know, uh, civil society uh, organizations. And I think what COVID has done which is fantastic, is it's really highlighted how we can do things differently, but we need to start normalizing it. It can't just be during a crisis. And just, you know, quick example, what we've seen this time around, which we didn't see in the financial crisis, and I hope we see post-COVID, hence, you know, the importance of the piece going to 2023, is, for example, that the bailouts that have been provided to different industries globally, for example, the ones that have been really hard hit, like airlines, because they're not flying as much, have been in some countries, and I come back to this issue of heterogeneity, not every country has done this the same, um, those bailouts to airlines, but also to autos in some countries have been conditional on the companies receiving the public benefit to commit to reducing their carbon emissions. This happened in France where Macron was very clear. He said, we're not here just to bail you out. We wanna help you transform because otherwise we shouldn't use the word build back better. Or in Austria and Denmark, they also made the bailouts conditional on companies not using tax havens. You know, it's not rocket science. Let's do that. In the U.S. even, the U.S. CARE Act had a bit of a seed for something that didn't actually then happen, but there was discussion about it that companies receiving bailouts can't just use that money to, say, buy back their shares. In the last 10 years, $4 trillion have been used by companies just to buy back shares to boost stock prices, stock options, executive pay. So how do we bring that notion of a social contract to the center of this notion of purpose and a more purposeful system? Personally, I think unless it's conditional, it's not going to happen. But the word condition kind of sounds negative. It sounds like someone has a stick over your head. We need to change that too. This really needs to be about a win-win, about building back better. And those companies interested in long-term growth really need to radically change how they're working uh, with governments. And I'm a bit less optimistic, by the way, of what we're seeing. You know, it's great we have a vaccine, for example, or almost in terms of a complete rollout, but the way it's being governed is still problematic. In a truly symbiotic and mutualistic ecosystem in different areas, including health and specifically around the vaccine, would make sure, for example, to govern the intellectual property rights in a way that really foster what Dr. Tedros and, and who talks about collective intelligence, so using a patent pool. Pfizer has not signed up to that. We should make sure that the prices of the vaccines actually take into account the public contribution. You know, there's been lots of different governments that have contributed not only to this vaccine, but also to the different drugs like remdesivir, and historically almost all blockbuster drugs trace a lot of their research back to the public sector, and yet the prices of those drugs or vaccines don't reflect that. So we really need to get our hands much dirtier than we have in the past in terms of what it means to create a mutualistic ecosystem. Right. The, the, the skeptics of stakeholder capitalism argue that capitalists and capitalism by their nature are, are really predator prey, not symbiotic. Mm. And, and uh, t t tell us about how would your, your, your book, um, The Moonshot Guide to Changing Capitalism, how, how do you outline, how, how do we change that? How do we make sure 
that it really is um, mutualistic, as you say, and not predator prey. Sure. So what I do in the book is to sort of start with, you know, the moon landing when 50 years ago, great, ambitious, you know, bold, inspirational a mission to get to the moon and back again in one generation. There was that great speech where Kennedy was like, you know, this is also going to be hugely expensive. We might screw up along the way, but it's worth it and so on, you know, what would it look like to bring that kind of ambition to the sustainable development goals, to have real leadership. But it's not about like a top-down state-driven system, right? It's about really setting the direction for change, being really ambitious about it, and then redesigning. I, come, I always come back to this notion of design, redesigning everything we have on the ground from procurement policy, grants and loans, and these are all interfaces, of course, with the private sector, which receive procurement contracts, grants and loans, to really foster collaborations to work together towards solving the goals. And what's interesting about the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, there are 17 of them. They're really broad and inspirational. They're challenges which were negotiated. They didn't come down just you know randomly. They were negotiated globally, but they're very broad. So transforming them into moonshots. So the Clean Oceans one saying 90% of the plastic out of the ocean. No one country is going to do that alone. And no actor, state or private, will do it alone. It requires a new form of collaboration. But the real tragedy, and this is you know, what I talk about in the book, there's a whole chapter dedicated to this, is we now no longer have the capacity and the dynamic capabilities that we need within governments because they've bought into this notion that they're there just to fix market failures. And I advocate for a market co-creation, co-shaping agenda, which then would require both the private sector and the public sector to be investing within their own knowledge creating organizations, as opposed to what we've seen definitely in the UK, this immense outsourcing of the public brain to say consulting companies. Um, and one of the reasons the vaccine rollout is working quite well in the UK compared to the testing rollout, which didn't work well, is the vaccine rollout is actually happening through the public health system, through GPs. And you know that requires also strengthening that public health system, whereas the testing occurred purely through an outsourcing mechanism, which in and of itself is not a problem unless it's accompanied by what we've seen, which is uh, um, an underfunding of the brain itself, if you want, of government, which it absolutely requires when crises occur, but also, again, in the everyday governing, uh, you know, what it means to build back better. Um, thank you. Um, Angelique um, uh, Kijo, um, I wanted to ask you to really jumping off what Mariana just said about um, take, for example, plastic out of the ocean. It's going to, no one country can do it. Um, you're, you're a global citizen um, in all of your work, um, an advocate, um, great advocate for collaboration across borders. Uh, one of the things that strikes me is how hard, given how hard it is at the moment in particular to get collaboration within borders, um, um, Prime Minister De Cruz spoke about, about that and we're all feeling it. How do we find a path back to the kind of international collaboration that these challenges require? Uh, I think uh, thank you for asking the question and I listen to everybody and it is really interesting what I'm hearing uh, to talk about collaboration they have to be respect of one another and when we talk about global economy we're talking about uh, stakeholder capitalism it doesn't shareholder capitalism doesn't work in Africa we don't have that in Africa my continent is never on the global agenda when it comes to capitalism when it comes to anything that only profit the Western country and the rich countries. And the leaders of Africa are shareholders of all those big companies we've been talking about. They do not care about their own population to create job or to create anything. Of course, to get the money, they start learning from all this uh, forum that we, we do to patch up the outside of their home to get money from the rich countries and nothing goes back to the people. And if we're talking about stakeholder, we need people in Africa to be educated, to have jobs, to participate in an economy. How can we build an economy in 53 different countries that take into account the most vulnerable people, the women? They create more jobs than anyone, but they don't have access to finance. You have all those banks in Africa. They only lend money to the middle, the mid business, the medium business size, and the biggest one. The one below that can get out of poverty they don't have access to money. Mar Mariana is talking about su sustainable development goal, but none of those 17 goals we can achieve if we don't tackle first poverty. When people are hungry and they're 
all, all the energy day in, day out is to think about putting food on the table for their children. Nothing we're talking about here work. And when I hear digital as a solution, that does not work too, because digital is also discriminating. The one that have the money to go to digital will go to digital. The poorest that we have to, to help, they don't understand they can do the business with cell phone. I mean, we have been helping Africa instead of empowering Africa's economy. Africa is the richest continent on the planet. Yet, the rich country have managed to take the resources out. Anytime this COVID pandemic is going to finish, we're going to end up with a lot of debts. The rich country that are making money to get the economy back up will be good, but us, we won't be good. We, be, we, be, we will hold, we will fall back and back. And what does it create to the rich countries? Immigration, the oceans are more and more polluted. We can't fight climate change without people being educated about what they have to do. The whole global economy depends on the well-being of Africa. If that continent don't, we, we don't change the way we do business, with African leaders, not giving them pass for everything. Then when we invest, we want return. When we give money to government, we don't want return. So we keep on feeding into the poverty, the lack of education, the lack, I mean, we kill the creativity of young Africans. And we all sit here with goodwill, talking about all the things you hear in, we work in Europe, we work in America, because you have a system in place. But in Africa, it won't work. So we can't be talking about global economy without paying attention to what is going on in the con on the continent of Africa. Europe will never get away with the immigration that is coming to take what is taken away from them. We can't fight immigration if we do not help the young African to find work in the country. When you hear an, an immigrant say, death is better than the poverty I'm living in. How can we come to this far for people to be so desperate and while we sit and talk, we talk number. Economy for me is always number. I don't see people. It does when we're talking about economy, I don't see a face of a human being. Algorithm has become a weapon to create more poverty. Algorithm become the atomic bomb that is created by the new uh, 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 technology that is out there. It's not taking care of people. We're talking about trust. We're talking about fake news. What is what is really feeding? those people on internet the fact that they feel they feel disenfranchised they don't trust the system anymore they don't trust any government they don't trust anything because every time they try there's a system in place that stops them from trying so stakeholder capitalism are all i'm all for it but we have as mariana said to go back to the nitty-gritty at the bottom of it and build this, our society strong enough to understand that this COVID is showing us that we are interconnected. We are here with one another. We leave one person behind, we are gonna fail. The, all those dice, all these puzzles that we are, if we don't really tackle corruption, institutional corruption in Africa, that is really killing every day. As we speaking, people are dying from that corruption. And we're here talking about cap stakeholder capitalism that doesn't mean anything to us in Africa is something that disturbs me a lot. So, so, the, pri so the priorities are wrong in your... In your Completely. Discussion. Completely and, wrong. And, and as... Um, I mean, we're talking about stakeholder capitalism today with a particular focus on business, but of course, trillions of dollars and euros are are being uh, uh, spent um, um, as stimulus to, to pull um, uh, countries out of this uh, crisis. And I, I'm reading into your um, perspective here that those uh, pr plans are too inward looking, that they're, they're really focused on uh, the US stimulus on the US and the EU stimulus on the EU and so on, and leaving out we're not going to solve it unless we unless we extend that beyond borders. Is that that is that your? That's exactly what I'm saying. And we need to really strengthen the the banking system in Africa, the financial system in Africa. The the the, the, the thing that is really um, uh, painful for me, uh, as I say, is that we don't have any currency that can make it to the Wall Street. 
our currency, the country where I come from, my currency is indexed on the euro. <clears throat> so you, how can you have any economy when you don't have your own money? How can you have an economy when the rule of post-colonialism is still imposed upon the countries? I mean, our leaders are facilitators for that. They are the client of the rich country to continue taking the, the, the resources out of Africa without creating anything in return for, the, for us to create our own economy. I mean, for people to be in, able to invest in African businesses. The businesses that are there that are thriving in Africa are owned by the rich countries, uh, uh, France, England, America, all those people that make do business in Africa, that make money out of Africa, are not the African business. Very few African businessmen are, are make money or are millionaires. There are some of them, but at, not, at the scope of Europe and America, no. The, um, um, the broad issue you raise is one, uh, Dan Schulman, I'd love to, to talk to you about, which is, um, and Klaus and I spoke about it a little bit at the beginning, you, you took a no layoff pledge when the pandemic hit. We did. We were able to as well at, at time. Many, many companies have, um, have you know, there's been a lot of, of, of success of wealth creation, you know, during this, this period. You've been able to increase uh, wages and lower benefit costs for, for your employees. But what Angelique is getting at is, is and I'd love a sense of, is, you know, really, I think, in a way, how much can this, how much can stakeholder capitalism um, how much can business um, uh, do given the depth of this uh, global crisis? Yeah. Well, thanks for uh, first of all for having me, uh, Edward, and um, it's really an honor to be with all of uh, my fellow panelists and uh, listen to all of their remarks. Um, I think that business has a very important role uh, to play in this, um, and I don't want to minimize that. And I don't want to minimize the responsibility that uh, CEOs and companies have to our broader communities. Um, I think um, uh, everyone's brought this up, but uh, the pandemic really, I think, just brought into stark relief uh, issues uh, and trends that have been with us for quite some time they may just not have been as visible. Uh, you've got several billion people throughout the world who live outside the financial system. In the United States, you have basically two thirds of adults, 185 million adults that struggle to make ends meet every single month. Um, and if we think about kind of our politics, our society, the social unrest we've seen, the political unrest we've seen, that, I mean, that rings true to me. Like, how can we expect somebody to embrace uh, democracy when they don't think that the system is working uh, for them, when they think that uh, others are doing well, but they're not doing well? And I think we as businesses do have an obligation to step up, to work with the public sector, to work within all the communities that we serve. And I think we have different roles to play. I, I think this idea that profit and purpose are at odds with each other inside of business is ridiculous. In fact, I would argue that the two go hand in hand. I mean, where do the best employees want to work? They want to work for companies that are making a difference in the world. They want to work for companies that are taking care of them. You mentioned that, um, you know, we lowered health cost uh, benefits, raised wages. Well, you know, one of the things I found when we did a survey inside PayPal, um, and, we're, and we're PayPal, we pay at or above the market in every single country that we operate in. But I found out that almost 50% of my employees were struggling to make ends meet at the end of the month. In fact, we created this metric. We called it net disposable income. It's how much money does somebody have after they've paid all of their taxes and essential living expenses? What I found out for about half our company is that NDI was 4%. And um, to me, that was just 
no wonder they were struggling. And we worked with academics and we worked with the governments and we felt like the minimum NDI necessary for somebody to be able to save, for somebody to be able to dream again about, um, you know, having their kids have a better lives than they do is 20%. And so we slashed healthcare benefits by 60%. We raised salaries. We gave everybody in the company equity. And today we've taken that NDI from 4% to 16%. And this year, I hope we get to uh, 20%. I think those kinds of things we can do inside our company. And I think every CEO has an obligation to, first of all, take care of your employees. We can't depend on governments or shift that burden just to governments to go do that. We can do that ourselves. And then we need to step up and address issues in our society, whether it be uh, racial injustice, social injustice. You know, we made a $535 million commitment to reduce the racial wealth gap uh, in the U.S. Um, I think those are the kinds of things that we, as leaders of industry, need to do. We don't stand in isolation. We stand in solidarity with the communities that we have, and helping that helps us. I, I, I have uh, want to follow up on a, on a, a couple of um, uh, key points you made, but um, um, I know Prime Minister DeCruy has to leave momentarily, and I would love to um, um, pose to him and, and, in a sense, to the two of you, um, you know, what what's the where's the line um, or how do you think about uh, what government should be doing in the areas that Dan just described um, uh, government policy um, regulation um, versus a kind of loose partnership I mean again this also gets to what to the theme of uh, Mariana's uh, book you know what what where what is the role of government in what um, and the aims that Dan just described, um, Prime Minister DeCruy. Maybe if I can echo on one element that uh, Dan mentioned is that, you know, if, if, if you have corporates who have bad behavior towards their clients, towards society, as an employee, you can be quite sure that if things go wrong, they will also show bad behavior towards you. And, and that, I think, is, is, is more than ever way that people look at it and, and the way that that people employees vote with their um, with their uh, with their feet so i i agree 100 percent with what dan said and and purpose and profit is not opposite if we talk about sustainability there is no activity that is sustainable if it is not profitable at one point and so profitability is not a bad thing quite the opposite but there are certain domains which obviously in, in the way especially on the european side we look at it are, are in a non-for-profit environment. That is the case for healthcare, um, and it has proven that it is a successful uh, formula. But in the challenges that we see now, we can achieve incredible things if everyone brings their best at the table. See what we have done in, in, in vaccines. I mean, if, if, if the public sector brings to the table what they're best in, being uh, funding uh, early stage research and so on, providing stability of financing. And if the private sector brings what they're best at, at the table, that is being innovative, speed, um, bringing things to market, see what we can do. I mean, we, we've developed vaccines in less than a year's time, or in general, it would take uh, eight years. And for me, that's, that really is the lesson. Instead of pointing fingers at each other, let's see what we are best at. And if everyone brings at the table what they're best at, I mean, what we, have we proven over the last months what humanity is capable of? I think it's mind-boggling. And we should continue doing it and have that mindset instead of um, being pointing at each other. Let's, let's see what we're best at and bring that at the table. If we do that, it can be incredible. Can I just add a, a framing issue on what was just mentioned? Is that okay, Edward? I don't know if we're allowed to bump in here. Yeah, so heard. in terms of this issue that Dan was raising, because I completely agree with him, I just want to give it a bit of a, a different twist. Of course, it's possible to make profits without purpose. What we want to do is bring profits and purpose together, but take any sector. If you take retail, you know, Costco and Walmart, 
uh, you know, we're making more or less the same profit margin, one through kind of, you know, innovation, and one basically through exploiting the labor force. This is, to be honest, to respect Walmart, it was before they actually started to change. In that situation, what you then need for government to do is to say, we're not here to level the playing field, this like word that or sentence that basically just means almost status quo, you need to tilt the playing field towards making it more profitable for those companies that are able to achieve a certain type of profit margin through innovation, through investment in the workforce and so on, instead of exploiting them. But that does mean really, again, getting your hands dirty with you know, tax, you know, whether it's capital gains tax to foster long-termism and not short-termism, or with companies of this sort to make sure they really are treating their workforce well in order to get a public loan and so on. But this notion about leveling the playing field, I think that's one of the things we should get out and bring in the notion of tilting, not meaning choosing one company, one sector, but getting a system that really rewards the kind of companies that we're talking about as being more purposeful. Mm -hmm. um, so so you're, you're talking about um, uh, government policy at some level? Um, and the framing of it. As a framing of it. Um, Klaus, if I could um, ask you to chime in, um, and I know you and Dan have worked on this together. Um, Mariana frames it around um, uh, government policy. Um, what about internally um, within the corporation? Um, you briefly mentioned this at the beginning, the metrics, where do you see the place of metrics, measuring commitment to stakeholders um, within corporations, public disclosure around those uh, metrics? No, first, first I want to express my, my appreciation for Dan. Uh, you are really a role model for um, uh, stakeholder capitalism. But let me come back to something which is fundamental. I think we have two different levels here. We have what has to happen inside a society where well, the government plays a key role in terms of taxes, uh, avoidance of taxation and so on. And then we have in specific insides of society, we have the role of the enterprise. And let's not forget the enterprise, the corporation is the world's creator. And um, many of the issues which were mentioned, like poverty and so on, uh, can be solved if we have enough and fair uh, wealth uh, creation. Uh, it's companies which, which drive innovation. It's companies um, who, um, uh, in a competitive way, uh, drive the fourth industrial revolution, drive uh, social benefits and so on. Now, the problem which we have is when we talk about capital, uh, we think of financial capital. But actually, what you need for wealth creation is not just financial capital. It's human capital, it's social capital, it's natural capital. So we need to, to embrace a much larger definition of capital and all those capitals create in a shared way uh, wealth and indirectly or directly for a uh, country uh, prosperity. So um, we, we coming back to, to, to the essence of your question, um, we still measure only how a company uses the financial capital, whether it's really efficient in terms of allocation of financial capital. But we should measure also uh, how a company, in which way a company uses natural capital, um, people, uh, planet, uh, in a most responsible way. So that's the essence of stakeholder capitalism. And here, of course, the metrics are important because otherwise, we stay with, I mean, every company has now a purpose, but um, we have to measure uh, how the company moves really forward in fulfilling this broader purpose going beyond just uh, serving shareholders. And, and um, how, how do you, um, you take that, um, that purpose, um, uh, those metrics, those commitments, um, uh, 
far enough to, um, you know, back to the concerns Angelique was raising, particularly in Africa, but in, you know, many places around the world, um, where, you know, the amazing things that um, Dan is doing at PayPal and many other, um, uh, you know, companies that have joined in this uh, movement are, are doing, but there's so far to go. Um, how, how does that reset how does the reset that's um, supported by stakeholder capitalism get to the poorest of the of the poor? No, give me. Uh, I'll give you just an example uh, related to what Angelique said. Um, corruption. Uh, if you are really forced in your reporting to indicate every dollar you paid to for non uh, directly. Um, uh, let's say, corporate-related uh, issues, um, and you have afterwards on a government level the necessary penalty system, and um, um, let's say you, you, you really hold companies uh, accountable if they deviate um, from uh, a good behavior. I mean, it's a dream, but we can make this dream uh, and, and uh, companies like Dan provides a good example. We can go into this direction of making stakeholder capitalism the core of our economic system. Uh, a moonshot, as I think Mariana would, would put it. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, 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 but I don't think we can have stakeholder capitalism if we continue, Klaus, to say that wealth creation is just in business. I think the whole point of stakeholder capitalism is to actually admit that wealth is collectively created. You know, everything that makes our iPhone smart and not stupid happened not just through government, you know, taxation in the background. It was actually government investment in the internet, GPS, touchscreen, Siri. And then, you know, private, the private sector did magnificent things with them. But we have to stop talking about wealth creation as just business. Sorry. Mariana, <laughs> Mariana if you take stakeholders, governments is an important crucial stakeholder in yeah. this context. But not so just for taxation, share, sorry, that was my point. It's, shared, it's also investment. Shared. But I agree with you, it shared wealth creation. So and the benefits should also be shared. Yes, but we cannot share the benefits properly if we don't also admit that we created it, created it collectively. And I think the really cutting edge discussions globally are where this distinction between wealth creation and wealth distribution, that dichotomy is no longer there. And we think about the direction of government investment and how it collaborates with business in new ways, in the ways that Angelique was talking about. So in non-corrupt ways and ways that are catalytic to really inspire bottom-up innovation, that that's truly how we talk about wealth creation itself. When government hold the wealth of the country, and it doesn't distribute the wealth. Yeah. That's it. There's nothing you can do because if you, you, the, the leader of a country is the one that own the main resources and that is profiting from it with his family, how are you gonna, you can't, I mean, it's, it's just, um, I wish we have a solution, Klaus. I just wish we have a solution that will work on African continent because the youth today in Africa, they are so entrepreneur. They have so many ideas, no money to develop. They, 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 I mean, it's crazy. Every time I go there, my head is a bubble. They bubble with ideas and they have all those beautiful ideas that, for example, then can finance and create more wealth and more job, but they can't, they don't have access to the money. And if they have that, and they have a, 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 a company that start working, then the government gonna come and say, you can't do this and they take away. How do you protect young entrepreneur, a new entrepreneur in Africa to do business, to create job, to create wealth without the government being on the back through tax or stealing their company away from them? That's the problem. And what I'm saying, I see it. I heard about it. It's not like I'm just making it up. It's the reality of the 2021 till today. So the COVID-19 is just hammering the young kids that have project and on the right to go to get off and they're stuck because they can't reach out to, to finance in Europe or anywhere else. And it's, it's a I want this stakeholder business capitalism to work. I want it to work because 
the kick people in Africa are the ones that are creating the wealth that has been hijacked by the leader of their countries. Uh, Dan, I, I, I mean, I, I asked this of uh, Prime Minister DeCruy, and and really, and we've all been talking about it um, um, throughout. How, where do you see this this um, line, if that's the right a word, between government, the role of government as a stakeholder, um, uh, and and the corporation? Well, I think uh, there has to be a partnership between government. Uh, between the private sector, between academia, uh, nonprofits, uh, we all need to work together. I don't think any of us can abdicate responsibility. You know, one of the things that I think and I believe in, at least, is that um, you can be overwhelmed by the extent of the problems that exist in our world. You know, we're facing, as I think you mentioned, or somebody did, multiple problems at one time that have all been magnified uh, by the pandemic. But I believe that leadership matters. Um, I believe that each and every one of us can make, even if it's a small difference, we can make a difference. Like, I know that I can make a difference with the resources that PayPal has, and there are places that I am doing my best to go and do that. I think we can encourage uh, government. We can encourage by investing in NGOs, by working with academia hand in hand to come up with solutions that we wouldn't come up with individually. I think, you know, the collective power of that whole can be very, very powerful. It is not easy to go do. And sometimes you just need to say, look, I'm going to go do this inside my company. I am going to, you know, give loans, as Angelique was saying, to uh, small businesses that otherwise wouldn't get them. And there is discrimination in the way that loans are put out. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, we dedicated money to just give grants to Black-owned businesses here in the U.S. that were hit particularly hard by COVID, 41% double the number of non-Black businesses, uh, owned businesses, went out of business uh, during the pandemic. And so helping them to get loans, helping them to survive through this pandemic, we felt was essential uh, to have a country that comes out of this that can at least start to come together uh, and prosper. And I, I think this idea of stakeholder capitalism is so important um, because, look, anyone can maximize profits next quarter. That's not, the, that's not a hard thing to go do. It's really, if you want to move from being a good company to a great company, if you want to build a long, enduring company um, that can make a difference, this is about building for the long term. I mean, I think if we if we have a purpose, if we inspire employees to do the right thing, we treat them well, we treat our customers and regulars with respect, as people were saying, then over the long run, we do maximize profit, we do maximize returns for shareholders, but we can't just think about one constituent versus others. We work in a complicated world and we need to have, um, we need to have solutions that um, are uh, multivariate uh, in response. I want to ask, uh, Dan said something that really is true. We need all the, all the pieces to work together because there's no way it's going to work without it because you can wash your left hand without your right hand. And everything in our world is like that. And what I'm doing, as you said, each one of us, we can, we can do something. I started an organization where I give seed funding to adolescent girls and young women in my country. I started three years ago. Last time I was there, it was late 2019. And the result of it is just mind blowing. Even myself could not believe how fast those young girl, young, those adolescent and young women gonna transform their family, their community, the COVID-19 hit the villages. 
Those young women from the get-go, they say, we're gonna produce soap, liquid and solid soap. And my question was, why are you doing such a small business? And they said to me, we buy the soap far away. When we come back, that soap, we have to divide the use of the soap in three, washing the dishes, washing the clothes, or washing ourselves. Our self-confidence starts from our own hygiene. So we need people to have access to soap. COVID-19 arrived, they were the first one to provide the soap, the water fountain, going to the radio and telling people in their different languages how to prevent COVID-19 to come to their village. Just a little seed, I mean, I mean, beginning seed goes a long way. That's why I, I'm, that's what I know this uh, stakeholder capitalism can work because if you give to people the ability to work, to create something for themselves, to dream, the kids do better. The family do better, the whole society and the world get better and we live in a world at peace and not in the world in pieces. Um, uh, inspiration to all of us um, and a lot of work to do. I'd love to let uh, Klaus um, have the, the, final, the final word and, and just your thoughts on, um, you know, great discussion today. Thank you all for being part of it. Um, Klaus, um, does this leave you? Where are you on the, you know, the, you, you announced a great reset. Um, there was skepticism, there was skepticism, there was optimism, uh, skepticism, a new word. Um, <laughs> where, where, where are you? Where are you on the, are you, if we, if we get this group together in two years, um, how much progress have we made? If I look back to the last 50 years since I created the World Economic Forum, humankind has made such a progress and it's a little things and if everybody gives more than takes in i think then we as a humankind will fulfill our obligations which we have towards the next uh, generation so i i have seen despite all the question marks we raised i have seen uh, many positive signals um, the last, uh, let's say, statement of uh, Kitjo. Um, I think uh, we stakeholder capitalism gives us direction. Now we have to walk fast to implement it. Thank you. Thank you, and thank all of you. Thank uh, you. Hope to see you in person soon. <laughs>